Welcome back to Municipal Month on the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I'm your host, Chris Brown, and I'm pleased and honored to have our guest on to the show today. She is in her first term as mayor of the town of Innisfail, and she has graciously accepted a spot to come on to the show to talk about herself and her community. I'm pleased to and honored to welcome Mayor Jean Barkley. Mayor, your worship, Jean, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chris, and I'm uh, excited to be here. I, I guess I should have asked this beforehand. Do you mind if I call you, Jean, during the interview, or do you prefer oh, your worship? Uh, no, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> us, us. Is fine. Okay. Um, so if you've listened to the show before, you know my first question, and that is, where did your sense of duty to serve come from, Jean? <laughs> You know, I think growing up, I, I grew up in a rural community east of Innisfail, and, um, you know, my parents, um, aunt and uncle, family, friends, you know, they were all very much about community service and, you know, the neighbors helping neighbors and all the things that go on in a, in a rural environment. So I, I saw firsthand that this happening around me and, uh, you know, even as a, a, a young kid, I, I would get involved and, and help out as well. So there was always a, a lot of sat satisfaction from serving. When, when did the service come go from volunteerism to political? You first got elected in 2017, but was politics always something that was in the back of your head that you wanted to give back that way? Yeah, I, I would say um, a bit of a political nerd as probably most people in this position are, but, um, you know, my, my work was such that uh, the, the two would not have gone together. So in 2017, I guess it was, I, I retired from RBC and I, I did that to choose to give a, give this a go. And um, so I'm, I'm grateful I did. I, I think what kind of uh, was the catalyst for that is, um, you know, that, Central Alberta had grown quite a bit. Uh, various communities in Central Alberta had a lot of growth and Innisfail had not. And so I, I think that was kind of the catalyst for me getting involved. I thought, okay, I, I want to participate and I want to see what I can do to help the community to go or to drive that direction for, for more community growth. How did you see... How do you see yourself playing a role in that? Because uh, growth and uh, growth is always a challenge that a lot of municipalities are facing, as I've found out a lot during the, this month long yeah. series. Yeah. Um, but how did you see yourself in 2017 playing a role in helping drive that growth with your background? Well, it's interesting, Chris, when you're the quarterback armchair quarterback sitting outside of council, it's pretty easy, right, to make things happen. And then when you get on council, when you realize that it's not quite as easy as maybe you thought it was. So, you know, if you if the growth isn't happening, whether it's residential or commercial industrial, you know, what, what is causing that? And, and that could be maybe a developer. They just don't want to take some risk in developing the properties, the land that they own in our community, because maybe they're developing in many other communities and there's only so much money and capital to go around. So, you know, trying to get that engine started again, uh, you know, I think how we have done it is through building relationships. And, you know, it's been a, a huge priority for this particular council starting in, in 2021. And we're starting to, to see some of the, the fruits of that labor and, and administration has been wonderful and very open. And, you know, we, we are open for business. And that's a message we wanted to get out to, to developers. And, and uh, this is a good place to invest. So, you know, how, how can we work with you? We're going to talk about the community here in a few minutes, but I want to stick on you for a few minutes, if you don't mind. I want to go back to that 2017 election. So transport ourselves back into October of 2017. You have just ran a campaign. The ballot boxes are closed. The tallying starts, and it is declared that you are one of the next councillor elects for the town of Innisfail. What's going through your head at that moment? Um, well, I think probably a lot of pride you know the fact that you do get elected I mean that that's a, um, a vote of confidence from the community and um, you know I, I think maybe even more so this time you kind of wake up the next day and you go oh my gosh I'm the mayor of this community now and I, I think you know overall really it's a privilege and that's how I look at it and and um, so it, 
you know, it's a little overwhelming at first without question, you know, in 2017. And, and again, you know, be because you were on the outside looking in, I, I had attended council meetings, but you really don't get the full scope of everything and really understand the mechanics of, of how everything works and the processes that are in place and, you know, that relationship between council and administration. And, you know, when somebody says, oh, you know, my, my garbage didn't get picked up this week, you know, that's not, you learn that's not something for me to solve, right? That's something you pass on to administration that's an operational issue so they will solve that so you know kind of keeping that getting that understanding between what does council do as a governance body and separating that from the administration and, and the operations of the organization I, I i love the analogy of an armchair quarterback because there's a lot of people outside of politics who look at municipal politics and they think they have the solution for everything that first term as counselor for you that is a learning curve because no matter how well you may be prepared to go into politics on a municipal level there's always a challenge or an educational mm -hmm. aspect for you that first term for you what was the biggest learning experience that you had to sort of change your mindset when it came to municipal governance you know i, I think going back to the development um, process and and realizing that you know, we cannot make developers build homes, right? They have to want to, and yes, we can work with them and, and try to make it a, attractive, but it's not easy to turn that ship around, certainly in, in a short period of time. So I think, you know, through, I mean, let's face it, through the, the COVID years, to, you know, it wasn't easy being an elected official. There was a lot of division in the community and Innisfail was, you know, getting some press that maybe wasn't all that positive. And so, you you know, you, you're trying to work so hard at, at elevating the community and promoting the community. And yet, you know, you're in the news for some of the wrong reasons. And and um, so that that was quite frustrating as well, because we, we have such a great community. And, um, you know, it wasn't necessarily being portrayed like that outside the boundaries of our, our town. I, I've been to your community a few times through my travels going back and forth from Northern Alberta to Calgary. And I can say I've always felt welcome and I've always felt like I can stop in there and I could never see myself ever feeling like I'm not, I don't belong there. So the, the negative attention that you talk about, I, I, I never saw it because I saw what I saw when I was there. So I, I say, I, rec I recommend anyone to stop in your community when they're driving. Oh, it's not who the community was. It was just being how it was being portrayed maybe on, you know, outside and, and uh, social media. <laughs> Social media, yes, yep, yep, yes. Yep. Um, I, I want to talk about duty, uh, the the responsibility of an elected official because you get elected and now you the decisions you make, whether you believe they're the right choice or you believe that this decision is the wrong choice for the community, you will hear about them. How much of a responsibility and duty did you put on yourself? A oh, wait, not duty, sorry. Did you put on yourself? to in that first term and even into your term as mayor in one year as mayor how much responsibility and weight are on your shoulders to make sure what you're doing at council is always going to advocate and move this town forward in the best possible way that it can yeah well there there is great responsibility but as i said i i look at it more as a, a privilege how many people get to sit in these chairs and you know use that privilege to move the direction of the town so i think when you're strategic about that process it, it's very helpful so of course we you know do a strategic plan at the um earlier stage of of the term and that can be updated as we go along but you know what are the priorities we can't do everything we we all have financial constraints so what are those top priorities i think last term we probably had too many top priorities where you know this time we, we've narrowed it in a little bit and and um, kind of focused on, you know, things like economic development and housing and recreation and, and that kind of thing. But um, yeah, that, you know, you, you'll never please everybody. But I think if you can, when there is a decision, whether, you know, it's gone my way or hasn't, welcome to democracy. But when you can explain that decision, like why, why it happened and the evidence, the, you know, the information that was used to make that decision, that's when you explain that to people, I, I don't find people, I, I'm sure there's 
some, but you know, I, I don't find people upset. I think sometimes there's just a misunderstanding or, you know, not everybody knows the inner workings of, of every decision. So as council members, we always have way more information than likely what the public does, unless people are sitting in on council meetings, which for the most part, they don't. So is your community engaged? Is your community engaged on what's going on? Because I've talked to many municipal councillors and mayors across this uh, country, and the, I get a mixed bag from different parts of this country when it, when you talk about municipal issues. They know who your MLA is. They know who your MP is. But locally, they may not be engaged with their local councillors as much. So for the town, for your town, are they engaged on what's actually happening in your community on a municipal level? <laughs> I think so, Chris. I think it depends on the subject matter, right? Like, <laughs> True. Okay, water and wastewater, that might not be too exciting, but if you're talking maybe a potential new aquatic center, that's exciting. And, and uh, you know, again, top priority of last term and this term is community engagement and public engagement. And, and so as opposed to, like, we, we do a, a variety of things. We may have a town hall. A couple of months ago, we had an RCMP town hall, for example. You know, but other times, you know, we will go to where an event is and, and we can engage there. It may not be formal, but at least we are there and people can interact with us. Um, we recently held a community economic development launch evening where we invited community participants to come out. It was very well attended. Um, waste to energy project. We had a community event very well attended. So yeah, people are engaged depending on the subject matter. I want to I want to go in this line of uh, communication still here for a second because, as a public official, as a local gov uh, go governance uh, local official, um, you are on the front lines. You go to the grocery store; they know who you are. That you go to the restaurant; they know who you are. Mm -hmm. How do you balance that? How do you balance your work in pr pr the pu the public life of a mayor and the private life of a mayor? Because I can imagine going out from time to time, you just want to go have dinner with your family and you don't want to talk shop. You want to just go talk about the kids or the grandkids and you just want to relax. How do you balance that? I don't know. You know, I, I really enjoy talking to people and I, and, you know, people quite often they'll apologize. Oh, you know, I need to bother you, but, and I say, no, please bother me. Like that's my job, you know, is to answer your questions. And I don't find that it's people complaining about things. It's maybe people, they, they just want to know about something or, you know, have a chat and, and good for them for, for being engaged and, and being a part of that. So I, I don't find it bothers me at all, or I try to run away from it. Not, not at all. Like, I'm quite the opposite. I, I love the engagement piece because that, that tells me that people care. Well, I appreciate that. I want to turn to our second segment, and that's the, the community as a whole. And before I start this conversation, I want to preface this by saying this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a direction of council. This is not a motion at council. This is her opinion. And I say that because we've had comments already saying, why is this? Why is the councillor or mayor talking about this? It's not being in front of council because this is their opinion. So to, to, let's start off with the million dollar question that I've asked every other municipal official on this month's series. What is the biggest issue facing your community today? Um, I'd say likely, you know, maybe financial constraints because you want to do so many things, but you can't do everything. So, you know, trying to choose where the best bang for the buck is. I, I think the, you know, the big issue right now, we have an aquatic center that, that's aging out and we, we need to replace it. And so that's been a discussion for the last 18 months, uh, ramped up certainly with, with this council because we have that four year window in front of us. But, um, you know, how, how do you finance that? And, you know, what grants are available? I and mean, we're not ready to put a shovel on the ground at this point in time, but, you know, when we do what grants will be available, we have no idea, you know, what other levels of government will help us, we, we really don't know. Um, so I, I would say overall, when we look at everything you want to do, it's always, it's always the money, right? If we could, just that money tree in the backyard that we could pull from. You talked about the, uh, being proactive on thinking about an aquatic center five years, 10 years down, down the line, because it is aging out, or even 20 years down the line. How much should municipalities and particularly smaller communities like yours, 
be more proactive and not just thinking about the here and now, because we always want to think about the here and now, but start thinking about what's best for our community. While we may not see the glory of it right now in our term, 20 years down the line when people are using it, I will know if I'm retired or still on council, I've done my job by being proactive in planning for the future. Yeah, I and mean, that's a big challenge of the job, right? You, you may not be planning for now or five years from now, you might be looking 20 years from now. And, you know, what? I, I think what um, certainly our administration team, they're, they're working on um, you know, asset management model right, right now. So, you know, has the community for the last 20 years has to put enough money put aside to do some of these replacement things. And, you know, we, we all tend to kick the can down the road because we don't want to raise taxes too much, right? So, well, we, we better not do that. We better not put that much money aside. You know, we'll, we'll just kind of keep things where they are and have a minimal tax increase. But then when you go to replace something like an aquatic center, you know, it, it's a lot of money. Or you may be looking, you have this dream of a multiplex model. Where does that come from, you know, the, the funding? And, and so, yeah, it's, you know, the municipal development plan, all sorts of things where you have to plan way out. And, and that's a challenge, you know, like what is the commu community going to look like 20 years from now? What is, what is the, uh, what is industry going to look like or going to be, we know the jobs will be different, but how? You talked about the fiscal restraint because we are in a time of very much fiscal restraint uh, with us coming out of COVID-19. And uh, let's be honest, not everyone's back to full workloads and with inflation the way it is, this year's budget process, particularly for smaller communities, is going to be tougher than it has ever been before we are heading into budget season. This is the time when Alberta municipalities are going and sitting down with their administration saying, okay, what's your wants, what's your needs and what's your, okay, if we had a million dollars extra, what would you really, really want? How do you look at it now going into this budget cycle? Because you are the mayor, you're leading this conversation. While you are one vote, you are leading the conversation. So from your perspective, how are you looking at this budget to make sure that the people of your community aren't affected as much as they may be have been in the past because of all the other uh, outside issues that are going on in the world. Yeah, no, it's going to be challenging, I, I think, Chris, um, from several fronts. So, you know, there's still a lot of unknowns out there. Um, I think we're starting to see some of the inflationary pressures tail off a little bit if we look at the month to month numbers over the last two or three months. It's um, looking a little bit more promising, um, you know, but there's still a lot of un uncertainties out there in the world. Um, you know, I think of Ukraine as a prime example. How does that impact things and, and how does that end? Hopefully some point in time peacefully because that impacts you know, oil gas prices on a world market. You know, that of course has a huge impact in Alberta. You know, we just came through a, a very uh, successful, you know, provincially, um, year end with you know, over a 13 billion dollar surplus but you know being a, an older Albertan we've been through this before <laughs> and um, you know it, it can disappear in, in a hurry and, and it can change a lot so you know it, for, for municipalities in Alberta like we are looking right now our provincial government the, the funding model they're looking at right now the the um you know, civil sustainability initiative, which we refer, refer to as MSI, it's going to change into the local government fiscal framework, but, you know, th that is set to, at a, to potentially be at a base rate 36% less than what we have averaged over the last 10 years. So that is very significant. And how do we make that up? So our community, uh, our council, and our administration team, we've really been looking at, um, kind of the, those top line numbers, you know, what are other things that we can do to increase our revenue as opposed to cutting services, you know, pulling back, not hiring staff that we so desperately need potentially. And, and so I, I think this budget, we, we probably won't be quite as aggressive as we were last year, we were very ambitious. And I think this coming year, we're going to have to pull back a little bit because of inflationary pressures. We don't know what that's going to mean for increases for staff, um, you know, cost increases for road construction, 
water, wastewater replacement underneath those roads, sidewalks, you know, kind of all that basic stuff. And so we'll, we'll see where it lands, but. Um, Are you in a kind of a holding pattern then right now? Because with the new premiere that we have, we're, we're still seeing some changes. We're, uh, we're recording this before a cabinet shuffle, before yeah. any idea of what's going on with her vision for the economics of the province. Um, yeah are you in kind of a weird position as a municipality? Because you're kind of have to wait and see what the new premier is going to do here. Yeah, for, for sure. Everybody's in, in the same boat right now. So as you said, a new cabinet will be named on October 21st, but you know, there's also an election next May. And, and uh, so, you know, things may be up in the air for a little bit, but I, I'm sure this government, you know, they'll, they'll put their, their vision in place with the new premier and um, we'll see where that goes. I mean, she certainly said lots about being focused on rural. So we will see what that means. You have mentioned a few issues and one that really jumped out to me was labor and staffing. Um, a lot of municipalities, and I, I don't say just yours, but a lot of municipalities are finding it harder and harder to recruit uh, staff to their organization and keep them there long term. How does a municipality like yours look through that glass and say, okay, what are the options that we need to try to recruit the top talent, but not just recruit them, but keep them here? Well, I would say that we're very fortunate that we have top talent right now. There you go. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and I, I don't uh, really see any of them wanting to, to leave. I, I think we have an absolutely great team here in the town led by Todd Becker, our CAO, and, and um, he came 2017 in August, and um, he has just been a wonderful find, and um, yeah, we're, we're very blessed in, in MSPL to have the team that, that we do have, and, and I, I think, you know, that that culture, when you have a good culture at the organization, it attracts people. You, you have been on council for two terms now, well, five years altogether as of uh, airing this, because it is up to that one year since your last election. Um, the, the responsibility of council is to direct the CAO. The CAO is the only staff member that the council is hired, and that is their only uh, ca uh, staff member. Um, was that a learning curve? Because when I got into municipal politics, you always think council can come talk to the director of operations or the director of public works or the public uh, community services. But you realize as an elected official that no, <laughs> that doesn't happen on a regular basis. Yeah, yeah, I, I would say uh, Chris had taught me it very clear from day one <laughs> <laughs> how that works and how that process works. And and if somebody slips up, it's uh, you know he's he's not shy to say no, no, that that's. Uh, you know, and I understand it. And it was kind of interesting because Todd and I, we were recently on a panel with the Alberta Municipalities Association at the convention in Calgary with um, the mayor of Cochrane and the CEO. And it was kind of around culture and, you know, is council part of the organization or external to it? And, and you know, and the, the communication be, between council and, and administration. And, you know, it, it's so important that, you know, councillors understand that, you know, your, your portal into your organization is through that CAO. And it doesn't, you know, in a small town, like you run into people, right? You run into staff members or, you know, you're on volunteer with the service club and, and you may be doing a project within that service club. And of course, they kind of turn to you and say, well, maybe you could reach out for some, at somebody at the town. It's like, well, no, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, it, it's a challenge and I think it's even more a challenge like for people that are business owners and they're on council and, and, you know, that kind of that fine line and that balance and everything. So it's, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, that this council and our administration team, we have a great relationship and people understand that. And, but, you know, we always emphasize people look at you first and foremost as a counselor. I don't care what else you do, whether you're a member of Rotary or whether you're the business owner, whether you're on the historical village volunteer board or whatever, you are looked at first and foremost as a counselor. You 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 have segued into the perfect uh, <laughs> next segment, not next segment, but next questioning I have. And that is 
dealing with local issues because you've talked about the issues that you believe that are important to the community and that are facing your community. But I guarantee you, if I went to Innisfail tomorrow and I talked to a hundred people in your community, they would all have a hundred different issues, whether it be a local pothole, whether it be at street, whether it be a tree trimming, whatever, they would all have different opinions. How do you as council mayor counselor balance that because you are there to not only represent the people who have elected you, but also to look at the town as an entirety. You can't be there to just serve your friends and your family, but you have to serve everyone. So how do you balance the needs of the town against the individual needs? I think that, you know, maybe more Chris into operational issues. So if you have individual residents coming with kind of these one-off issues, chances are maybe it's more of an operational thing. And, um, you know, I, I think it goes back to being strategic about what we do, being able to explain to people we, we can't do everything. But, you know, if you have somebody down the street that they have a pothole, well, you know, I'm going to take that to the CEO. So process, right? Goes to the CEO, the CEO passes that on to whomever he needs to within the organization. That person would reach out to the resident. I may follow up or they will let me know, yes, we reached out to Joe Blow. We spoke to them about the pothole and, and we're going to fix that in two weeks time. So I think communication is the key always. And how so much yes. how much does communication play a role in your life as a mayor? Because um, I, I worked in communications and marketing for a municipality in Northern Alberta. I can tell you that you can communicate until you're blue in the face. There's going to be at least one person in your community that says, well, I didn't hear about it. So how do you communicate and not just the town, but yourself as mayor? Well, I mean, I, people can phone me anytime they want. They you know, can phone the town office, probably have my cell number and, and um, you know, communicate face to face. But um, I, I think it's important to have that open communication. And when you talk about, well, if there's issues or somebody, you know, is unhappy about something, you know, the communication is key to that process and, and making sure that person's informed. So there's nothing worse, I think, for any of us, right? If we went to somebody and said, you know, I have a problem about A, B, and C, and you never hear, oh, yeah, I'll look after it. But then you never, ever hear from anybody. That's what frustrates people. You know, people want to be heard. So you know, let's hear them. Let's acknowledge them. Let's see if there's a fix to, to what they're asking. And sometimes there is, and maybe sometimes there, there isn't. Or they go, gee, I didn't realize that. Thanks for explaining that to me. Are people actually like open to hearing uh, what actually is happening instead of just saying, okay, we can't do it now, but here's why? Are people open to that in your community? I think so. I mean, I'm sure there's people that you know, or not, but um, I think for the most part, you know, people are, are great and they're reasonable without question. Um, you are the, as I said earlier on, the front line of governance. You are there and you will be approached at the grocery store. You will be approached at the mailbox, wherever. Do people in Israel understand differences between federal, municipal, provincial issues? Or will they come to you and say, I have an issue with health care as my mayor, as my counselor, you need to fix it because I've elected you to fix it. Do you get like issues, not just on a municipal level, but from all different levels as well? Absolutely, especially on the health care file. And, you know, health care is not within our purview. And yet, in my opinion, it is because that impacts the community. So if health care is not operating the way it should, then that's going to impact residents. So if I have residents that are having surgeries canceled or they're having to go to emergency in Red Deer and it's a 16 hour wait, you know, that's impacting our community. And you know, obviously as municipal leaders, we, we don't have the fixes for that, but you know, let's collaborate with who we need to collaborate with and let's get that message out. And, and so I, I would say, Healthcare, probably of all the areas, has has certainly been been a um, a, a bit of a can be a contentious issue at times. Like I, I go back to two thousand and it's probably nineteen eighteen nineteen, where the master agreement with between the Alberta government and and the, the physicians were was uh, unilaterally cancelled. Like that became a huge issue in in our community, 
and um, you know, the doctors got quite vocal and, and put on a community event. There was close to 350 people there that wow. evening. And, uh, you know, certainly as some of, from, some of us from council were, were there as well, so supporting them. And, um, you know, well, how do you team. advocate for that? Because I, I can imagine this healthcare issue is not an issue that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, but there are discussions happening behind the scenes, but residents don't often know about those discussions, right? Because those are usually in camera or a phone call or an email. How do you advocate while still trying to say, okay, it is a provincial issue. I'm working on it, but this is another level of government and bureaucracy, God bless it, is so slow when you're trying to deal with two different levels of government. Yeah, you know, and healthcare, I mean, it's not just an Alberta issue. It's, I think, you know, with COVID everywhere is struggling right now. And, um, mm. you know, I, I think the process for us at least is typically, you know, if we're going to be the face of some of that advocacy, it, it needs to be done through our MLA you know, maybe through the, the Minister of Health and and also potentially done as more of a regional approach. So if we have the Red Deer Hospital in Central Alberta and that's the only hospital with ICU, you know, it's a hospital that so many communities are accessing because, you know, if you have a heart attack, you might get taken to Red Deer or you might get taken to Calgary. We don't know, but you're, you know, it's probably not going to be... Um, addressed here if it's severe that that's for sure and and do you so, have a local hospital i apologize yeah, yeah, i apologize yeah, for asking do. that stupid yeah. question it's just yeah. I, I i've never gone to the hospital in your community i've gone to gas stations i've gone to a few parks no we, we have the innisfil healthcare center so i i think there's i think it's 28 bed facility there's also an emergency department in there and we have long-term care attached to that as well so you know back in the day uh premier law he he made sure that there was a lot of these hospitals in, in smaller communities like ours. And, um, you know, grateful to, to have it and, and uh, it has served very well. We have a great group of physicians here in town, great group of healthcare professionals, but, you know, a lot of patients may end up in Red Deer, you know, going through emergency, or we also have issues with access to family doctors because there's there's not enough. So there's quite a, a long wait list, I understand. So, you know, as I said, it, it's how we can work together. It's not for me to go out there and say, oh, I have a solution to fix all your problems because I wouldn't have a clue where to start. I mean, it, it's so complex and it's so big. And, um, but, okay. you know, as, as a region, we, may, we need to make sure that we, we're on top of that and, and we're advocating for each of our communities because everybody struggles a little bit in, in that respect. I, I recently spoke to your fellow mayor in your community, in your area, uh, Mike Yargo of Penhold, the town of Penhold, and he talked about the RCMP. And mm -hmm. that is one of the big issues that his community is facing with rural crime right now. Um, first off, I just want to know, how's your relationship with your local RCMP detachments? It is excellent. We also have a police and safe community committee. And so there's two counselors on that, as well as community members and the RCMP are liaison with that committee. So they are at the meetings and we have a great relationship with the RCMP and uh, we, we set priorities with them. And there's really good communication between our administration team and the RCMP and our emergency management uh, services as well. Uh, we do have a detachment here in the community. So there's officers that serve our community and there's also officers in that detachment that serve the county area. So the Penholds and the Red Deer and Red Deer County. Strategic Steps works with local municipalities, boards and school divisions across Canada, providing guidance and expertise in governance, strategy, and sustainability. They work with clients to build on existing strengths, develop recommendations that are practical, sustainable, and strategic, and lead professional development sessions that drive organizational excellence and council and board member growth. From strategic planning to organizational and governance reviews to governance workshops and more, Strategic Steps has the tool tools, experience, and expertise to help your organization reach its goals and set itself up for future success. 
To book a consultation or learn more about Strategic Steps Incorporated, visit strategicsteps.ca today. I want to turn to our last segment because I'm do, I am cautious of time here. And this is my favorite segment of the show because that is tourism, 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 tourism. <laughs> yes, I just saw the mayor's eyes light up there when I said that for those who are listening to this via audio. Tourism. We have listeners and viewers from across Canada, Central Alberta, Central uh, Ontario, or Ontario, Central Canada, in the United Kingdom, in Germany, in Ireland. And if I was a tourist coming through your community tomorrow, the town of Innisfail, what are the unique hidden gems that I should be looking out for to make sure I stop and see what if I'm in your community? Well, if you're coming during the summer, um, <laughs> we have a Discovery Wildlife Park, which is a, a large um, park uh, owned by the Boss family. And they're actually um, in November, they're going to be... Uh, uh, they, they have a Christmas light display, so there'll be a drive through opportunity to see the Christmas light display. I believe uh, Doug Boss told us the other day we, we went out to the park for, for a visit council, and I, I believe he said they're, they're going to be installing 26 miles of Christmas lights. And they have all sorts of Christ, Christmas displays, and, and so it, it's a very large area, you know, it's quarter, well, 100, 100 acres or whatever, but um, so that, that will be something to look forward to in, in November. Uh, in the summertime, of course, they're, they're open for people to, to come to the, the park and see the bears and, and the wolves and all sorts of things. We have a 27 hole golf course here in Alberta, in Innisfail, one of the best golf courses in Alberta. Uh, we have a ski hill um, golf course in the wintertime, people cross country ski and snowshoe out there. We have, um, a pond where people go kayaking and canoeing. We have Centennial Park, which is, is really the jewel of our community. It's you know, probably around 100 acres. It includes a, a large body of water with a, a lot of waterfowl on it and beautiful walking trails and around that Lake Nature Trails and Off Leash Dog Park. We have lots of festivals and events during the summer. And, and of course, getting into the Christmas season, we have festival trees and, and we have hometown Christmas. And so there's lots of things going on in the community to, to come and check out. As, as someone who is really excited to get his Christmas tree up in November after Remembrance Day, I can tell you, you have just made a, a stop on my Christmas itinerary to come to your community for the drive through lights, because I just love doing that. Um, I want to ask the, uh, for you, though. After a long day at council, after a long day of just dealing with constituents' work, dealing with uh, issues that are that have been brought up at council, is there a unique place that you like to get away in your community that you can just decompress? Is it a park? Is it a walking trail? Is it uh, for Christmas? Those Christmas drivers. <laughs> what is it for you? <laughs> Well, for me, it's definitely Centennial Park and the Napoleon Park Trail that goes around the lake. So it's a nature trail. It's it's not paved. It's very quiet. It's trees. It's birds. It's um, I'm a Rotarian. So a few years ago, we uh, built observation decks out there. Uh, there's a couple of them. So go go sit on one of those and and stare at the water and listen to the birds. And it's just quiet and peaceful and and absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> And my last question for you, and you can take as long as you want to answer this, because I can imagine there's a, so much that you want to say about your community, but what makes the town of Innisfail such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? You know, I, I think it's the people that are here, um, you know, just wonderful community spirit, um, I sometimes marvel and I wish we could quantify the volunteer hours that are put in in a year in, in this community, whether it's festivals and events, I and mean, that's not the town necessarily doing that. That is volunteers in our community who have said, you know what, I want to start a lantern festival. I want to start the harvest festival. Um, you know, the, the senior center in town, I, I know that, um, that volunteers there they, they put over 2,000 hours a year in, into volunteer work so so I, I just think it's that community spirit and you know people helping each other and and um, you know there's we used to have a, a slogan here a few years ago it, it was we had it all and I, I really believe that's true 
you know, we, we have the recreation, we have the parks, we have the trails, we, we have, you know, just a, a great quality of life here in, in Innisfail that people enjoy lots of sports and, and championship teams and yeah, lots of things going on. That's, that's all excellent. Well, I want to thank you so much for taking 40 minutes out of your day and sitting down with me and talking about yourself, but also your community. Um, I, as I said, you're at the beginning of, well, at the, almost at the beginning of the interview, your community is such a great place. I, I, every time I used to drive back and forth to Northern Alberta before the uh, sort of co the pandemic, uh, I can tell you, I have spent many of days <laughs> filling up gas at your community and just taking a little walk through to stretch my legs. So thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. Well, thank you, Chris. And maybe next time you come through, let me know when we can sit down and have a coffee or something. That would I would love that. And I want to grab a little lapel pin from you as well, yeah. because I love your logo. Um, so with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews Municipal Month. As I've said on every single episode, put down your phone, put down Twitter, put down Facebook, put down Instagram, put down TikTok or whatever you call it these days, kids, and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society, it helps our democracy, and it helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking.